Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank Eric and Van Rooy for giving me the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, I'm expected to talk to you about the General Data Protection Regulation, and um, ideally I would like to do three things with you today. I think it would not be very productive of our time to um, sit down and say how Symantec can help you comply with the new regulatory requirements. I can list you products, I can list you solutions, but I'm not the sales guy. I'm actually the lawyer. Um, so rather than doing this, what I think makes more sense is that I walk you through why this is important, how it will affect you, and perhaps the most valuable thing for you would be how to operationalize the legal, the policy requirements from a technology standpoint. So what do you need to be thinking about? Perhaps I think it's also important to mention two caveats, one which is relevant for the discussion today and one which is not so relevant, uh, at least for the discussion of data protection regulation, but I think it's very important for you to be aware of because it happened just last night. So, can I have first of all a show of hands? How many of you think that operate what we would call a critical infrastructure? How many of you operate things like work in space like financial services, um, uh, transport, energy, telecommunications, government? Okay, not that many in this audience. All right, so the reason why I'm saying that is because uh, apparently last night their regulation on critical infrastructure protection across the European Union has been adopted. So that, and of, so it's been adopted informally yesterday, they got agreement, and it's going to be adopted formally within the next two weeks, a bit before Christmas. So when it comes to security requirements, that, the NIS directive, as we call it, the Network and Information Security Directive, together with this, the General Data Protection Regulation will be what will define security requirements in Europe from a regulatory standpoint for the next about 10 years. So, um, where are we today and where are we going to be? in a couple of years, in, in, in 18 months from now, approximately. Um, right now, what we've got in place is what we call the general, the data, protection regula uh, the data Protection Directive, the General Data Protection Directive, the Directive 9546 EC. As its name says, 9546 EC, it was adopted back in 1995. And that's what Belgian law is based on, the 1995 Directive. Um, the fact that it got adopted in 95 means that it was designed in about 1989, proposed in 1990, and took a few years for it to be adopted. You see that still in the text of the directive because it talks about file cabinets. I don't know about you, but I don't often anymore go and open a drawer with a bunch of papers inside that I will flip through and use cards that are in alphabetical old order to find what I'm looking for. I have seen that existing in my youth, but I don't do that anymore, and I suspect you don't do that either. Um, so, exactly because the existing law, which is the old law, the 95 law, has been based on a paper world, three years ago the negotiations started to change the legislation and adapt it into um, a paperless world. And adapted also to the fact that, you know, we've got search engines, we've got social networks. People want a right to be forgotten, which I'm sure you've all heard of. And we've ended up now to the other extreme. So if you look at the existing law, the 9546, the existing law has about 40 articles. The GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, the new law, has about 140 articles. So a lot lot, lot more detail, a lot, lot, lot more prescriptive. There's one other aspect that you need to be aware of, uh, and this is now the very legal in me 
directive versus regulation. Two words that sound very similar, tells you that you need to do something, somebody else says you need to do something actually. Uh, in reality, they're very, very different. Why? What we have, the old law, the 95 law, is a directive, which means what? Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, France, UK, Italy, Greece, Spain, Portugal, and the list goes on. Every member state has to take the directive and apply it to its national law by passing an act of parliament or by passing a, a royal degree. Um, now, that practically means that the Luxembourgian law is quite similar to the Belgian one, but not exactly. And, of course, it also means that the Dutch law is somewhat similar to the Belgian one, but not exactly because the Dutch have to be somewhat different to Belgium. And the German law is the strictest of all, usually. Um, the regulation, on the other hand, means that once the new law gets adopted, and according to the presidency of the European Union, which is currently held by Luxembourg, the effort is to adopt it, or at least close the negotiations, before Christmas. Um, the regulation means that once adopted, once agreed officially in Brussels, it applies across all member states, uniformly, without any act of parliament, without any politician in Brussels, in Berlin, being able to slightly change it, without any, any let's say, changes to address the French cultural exception. That means, effectively, that, let's say, once we have a regulation, to use a term from the Lord of the Rings, we have one ring to rule them all, okay? What's decided in Brussels applies in the UK, the same, copy and paste, as it would apply in Italy, and they can't change it, because it got decided in Brussels, and it's a regulation. It's the equivalent of the sledgehammer when one is trying to create harmonization. In the old regime, we had approximation of national laws. In the new regime, the idea is to have full harmonization. Now, where are we in the timeline? We are here. It's called trialogue. What does trialogue mean? It means basically um, a group of politicians, administrators and officials meeting together behind closed doors and doing the horse trading. That's the unofficial description of what it means. The official description is that the European Commission, the Council and the European Parliament meet and negotiate and try to find middle ground on the text of the regulation. Um, it appears, based on the information that has been published so far, that at least, whereas there are some chapters in the regulation that still need to be further negotiated, some chapters are pretty much agreed slash closed. So, for example, what I will be telling, to you, telling you about on security, it appears to be pretty much agreed. What I'm going to be telling you about international transfers, it's still open to negotiation, especially after also the recent uh, court's judgment of the European Union. Things like fines are still open to negotiation although the principle has been agreed that we're looking into a minimum-maximum approach. I'll explain what that means. So, some of the things are being close to adoption, some of the things are open to negotiation, but we're looking at the text which is at an advanced state of maturity. The European Union experience shows has missed occasionally some deadlines, but um, at least the stated intention on this one is that it closes sometime between Christmas and the first quarter of 2016. So we're really close to finalization. Now, who does it affect? Why should you care? And I've put in there, uh, let's say, names of big companies, not so much because the data protection regulation is for big companies. No, it's for big, for medium, for small. But I've put it there just to show big household names of completely different business models. It does not matter really in which business model you are in. As long as you process personal data, 
as long as you're using information that can identify an individual, you're caught. You got to address the compliance questions. Now, why is that relevant? I mean, why should I care how my customers feel about their privacy? Is there any indication that shows that customers might actually behave differently depending on whether I protect their privacy or not? We, that was a question that we faced. And as a matter of fact, we went and did a study. It's called the Semantic State of Privacy Report. It was done um, in uh, March this year, and you can find it. It's publicly available. Um, the study did a number of things. It actually did quite a bit of myth-busting uh, around, let's say, the perception of privacy in Europe. Like, do people care, or how much do they care? For example, the Germans uh, or the French care more for their privacy as opposed to, for example, the British. Um, actually, the study did not confirm that at all. It shows that the British, on average, care pretty much as much as the rest of the European Union. So, this slide actually tells you that when we asked the question of, uh, to, to the 7,000 people in seven different countries, how, whether data protection and privacy, the certainty or not of your data being protected is influencing the vendor with which you're doing business online, whether you're going to shop online or not, the answer that we got was that 88%, almost 90%, will choose as their first criteria whether a vendor is safe or not. Environmentally friendly is only 56%. That shows us something which is actually very interesting. Between personal data and common good, I'm selfish. Okay? I'll choose my personal data. To put it in an even more extreme, between my personal data and polar bears, I choose my personal data. Ice caps melting and all that. Okay? Short term, very sort of like individually focused, still relevant. Another thing, for example, that this study showed was that actually consumers qualify personal data in terms of financial gain. It means money for them. They understand making available their data as paying in a different format. And of course, then you get the other extremes, like, okay, how much do you think your personal data is worth? I will tell you, for some reason, the Italians believe that their personal data is by far the most valuable in the whole of the European Union. Again, I mean, I make, you know, the cultural aspects in some of these issues are, are pretty amazing. Um, do have a look at the report. Now, as somebody that works in Symantec and has to deal with a range of issues from critical infrastructure to privacy um, to um, law enforcement cooperation, cybercrime, cyber defense, uh, one should expect to see the issue of attacks and how the attacks are actually impacting customers, how they're impacting the whole ecosystem for that matter. What I think, however, is particularly interesting is, let's forget for a moment the sort of like, oh, the attacks are more, they're getting bigger, they're, they're stealing our data, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt bit. Let's focus on one thing. If nothing else, I want you to remember this. 60% of the attacks are targeted at the small and medium enterprises. The idea that there's going to be a cyber attack that will affect NATO, you know, uh, down, down, down in Brussels at Evere, or the idea that there's going to be a large-scale cyber attack that will affect, I don't know, the defense contractor or the government or some major public entity, public listed company. All that is true and it does happen from time to time. However, by far the most interested, interesting target to try to attack is organizations that, uh, for some reason, have a more focus on the business, less focus on security, nevertheless, they have access to interesting places. Attacking SMEs is a, ten, is a growth, is a, is, a, sorry, is, a, is a tendency that we've seen grow, growing over the years from 2010, I think, onwards. Why? Attacking the SMEs is valuable because they have less defense, interesting data, 
and they're a good stepping stone to go after the big organizations. So from an attacker standpoint, minimum effort, maximum gain makes a lot of sense. Now, one of the things that a lot of people have seen when the discussion about the data protection regulation takes place, actually there are two things most people have seen. The one is the huge, the humongous fines, and the other one is the obligation to notify security breaches. And let's face it, we get to see news about security breaches all the time. In the press, and we sometimes get ourselves some notifications. So, in this particular sort of like discussion, we, and this is also what we've said to the regulators, by the way, my job is to regularly talk to the regulators and advise the regulators on some of these initiatives, or at least part of my job. The other part of my job is to deal with also customer requests, like, you know, is this legitimate? Can we afford compliance for this? How does this work? Um, so, when I look at the question of breaches, the discussion is not how will, I, how will I make myself impregnable, how will I make it impossible to be breached, because that's not going to happen. Chances are, statistically in fact, it, it becomes almost inevitable that people will suffer a breach at one point in time. Therefore, the objective needs to be not to not have any breaches, but rather to minimize the size of the breach, the impact of the breach, to contain the incident and be able to respond and to mitigate from it. So, when we're looking on the discussion of, of data protection regulation, ultimately it becomes a discussion about how to protect information. And linked to that is things like mobility, things like the people in the process, the ownership of the business, if any, the growth of the data, the lack of the visibility, new technologies, the fact that people want to consume, and new, new stuff, and obviously the emerging threat landscape. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't remember anything of this presentation, just remember this, okay, this slide. Why? This is the essence of basically any data protection legislation that you're going to see anywhere in Europe. This is the essence of the old one, this is also capturing pretty much the new one. The big difference is the following. Historically, privacy has been seen as an individual slash consumer right. The Germans refer to it as the Information Selbstbestimmung Recht, the right to information self-determination. It's my data and I do with them whatever the hell I want. Okay? That's the idea. And I decide and I am empowered as an individual. The reality is that the regulators now have come to the evident conclusion, for us at least, that have been in the IT space for some years, that is not any longer just about the individual giving his consent to process the data or not by ticking the box. The issue is much, much more around good governance. So data protection is moving away from, it's still protecting the individual, but it's moving away from regulating how do you get legitimate consent. And is moving much, much more onto how you as a company, how you as an organization are allowed to take data from multiple sources, public, social networks, individuals, even your security sensors. Take them process them automa automatically in most cases, and then what are you allowed to do with them? So how do you capture, how do you process, how do you retain, how do you secure, how do you manage? Data protection regulation basically regulates the complete life cycle of information from cradle to death, including what you're supposed to do if you've lost them. That's the whole idea, and that's how you need to be thinking about this. Now, what's the advantage of good governance? I mean, assuming that you are able to get to that model, what do you gain? Well, first of all, you actually get business value from your information. You can use your information more effectively. In addition to that, you reduce the costs, you reduce your costs, you're able to be more agile, more innovative. Ideally, you're more secure and more integrated. So, in the end, 
one can argue that there are very clear advantages from the perspective of the regulator to drive that policy at the level of industry because that will create efficiencies. Now, if we were trying to look at it from the point of view of who is who, so, so what are the different relationships in this environment? Um, in a very simplistic way, which is actually the way that the law describes things, is the data controller, you, the organization that is actually capturing and processing the information for his benefit. The data subject is the customer, is you acting as a consumer. Me, going online to, let's say, to Amazon to buy something. I'm the data subject, Amazon is the data controller because it's taking my information. The data processor is very often the vendor is very often the company in the middle that is actually doing a job on behalf of the controller. So, Van Roy, to the extent that they're doing real-time uh, security monitoring of your environment, is a data processor. You're the controller, and me visiting your website is a data subject. This is the, tri this is the triangle of relationships. The data protection officer and we actually, that's, that's under negotiation right now, whether the data protection officer is going to be mandatory or not, above a certain size of a business, is the individual which the law will mandate inside the legal or IT department of an organization that will have the responsibility to ensure compliance and good data governance. I, I, to give you a bit of inside information, apparently the negotiation right now is between the one view that says there needs to be always above a certain size of company, a data protection officer, and the other view that says, oh no, that's too expensive, we need to have only for the data intensive industries a data protection officer. Now, I don't know about you, I have a problem figuring out what data intensive industries is. Probably marketing is data intensive industry, or I would say social network is a data intensive industry, but would you consider the amount of data that the supermarket chain, for example, coll is collecting data intensive? I would argue that it is when it comes to the way I prepare or organize my marketing, I organize my pricing, or I even do my competitive pricing. So it gives you a bit of an idea as to the kind of things that we need to be thinking about. So, what are the key topics that usually customers come and talk to Symantec, to me, about data protection? Well, first of all is information security. How do we protect the data? Chapter 4 of the new regulation, articles 30 to 33. 34, actually, more specifically. You see, after being busy with that for three years on the negotiations, you get to know the chapters by heart. So, um, cloud international transfers. And I'm sure... Many of you have seen the Court of Justice decision on the safe harbor and the fact that transfers of data out of Europe to the US have become more complicated. Does that ring a bell? I see many heads nodding, so that's good. We can, we can discuss that. I will tell you that I get this question daily. Okay? Every goddamn day I get the question ever since October 6th. So, you know, you have questions on that, shoot. Um, accountability, and what does it mean? And what does it mean in terms of the kind of processes that you need to have in order to be able to demonstrate that you are complying with the law? What do you need to have in place in order to show to the regulator, to an investigator, to a complainant that you've done everything you could in order to granny's rights or provide the information you needed or even prevent a breach. And then, of course, the question of the penalties around the law, like, am I going to go bankrupt if, if I'm actually found in breach? Um, on the information security, uh, so, as I told you, Chapter 4 seems to be close to closure, if not closed. Certainly not closed officially, but very close to agreement unofficially. Um, so, first of all, uh, the biggie, is there an obligation to notify security breaches? Yes, within 72 hours from the moment the breach has occurred. So, is there an obligation to notify the breaches? Absolutely. Do you have an obligation to notify the breaches to the national regulator? Yes. 
Do you have an obligation to notify the breaches to the data? Um, the obligation to notify the breach to the regulator is linked to the risk. There needs to be a certain level of risk associated with that. Do you have an obligation to notify the security breach to the data subject, meaning to your consumers? Do you need to go on national television and say, hi, I've lost, you know, five million credit card numbers? Um, uh, maybe. It depends on whether the data uh, is, let's say, of risk, of high risk enough. If it was credit cards, you probably have a problem. And second, it also would require that you have not been successful in protecting the data itself. What do I mean with that? For instance, there is explicitly foreseen a, what we call a technical safe harbor encryption, for example. If the data have been compromised but they have been encrypted, then you don't have an obligation to notify. So. You have an obligation to notify within a certain time frame. If, however, the data that has been, the system that has been compromised, compromised was containing the data in an encrypted format, you're off the hook from a public notification as well. So you have a requirement to secure the personal data. I mean, we are looking very much into a model whereby confidentiality, integrity, and availability is integrated inside the law. And in addition to that, you're looking also in requirements around ID management. And um, perhaps for the first time in European legislation, we do have a legitimate right to protect your systems. So your ability to do monitoring, your ability to collect data without consent of the data subject for your security operations is for the first time recognized as your right as a security administrator. It's a combination of Article 7F and Recital 39, if, in case any one of you wants to actually go and look inside the regulation. Um, as I told you, the cloud bit and the data transfers is one of the most complicated questions right now that people are gap grappling with. Um, I think it's very important to say that, you know, uh, actually, maybe it's more interesting to show this. European law does not forbid transfers of data outside one country or even transfers of data outside Europe. In fact, what European law does is it says that transfers within Europe are legitimate because they are assumed to have the same level of protection. Transfers outside of Europe can also be legitimate, but in order for them to be okay, in order for them to satisfy the requirements of the law, you need to be able to show that you have afforded the same level of protection. Before the court decision of the 6th of October, the safe harbor mechanism was considered to be one of the mechanisms that was affording a, a, a data transfer, uh, that was affording the same level of protection to data going outside the European Union. Now, what we have is a mechanism like, for example, cross-border data transfer agreements. So, um, safe harbor, without safe harbor, transferring of data is still very much possible. Now, on accountability, as I told you, the mechanisms of how do you demonstrate compliance with data protection, well, accountability is all about being able to show that you've taken the necessary steps, you've taken the necessary, um, let's say, mechanisms, the necessary uh, processes and tools in place to show that you comply with the law. So you've got the right matrices to show that how much systems you've got patched, what compliance levels that you have achieved, how is your information flowing within your organization, what approvals, what controls do you have in place in order to basically demonstrate that you are a good custodian of other people's data. How do you document? It's a way to demonstrate whether you have a privacy by design structure within your organization. Fines, 5% 5 of the global annual turnover with a maximum of 100 million euros. That has been the stated position uh, from the European institutions. That right now is under uh, extreme negotiation along the lines of, okay, this should be the maximum penalty, whether you see recidivism, so whether you're a repeated offender, um, uh, the size of the penalty needs to take into account the size of the company, um, uh, maybe we need to have 2% instead of 5%, and on and on and on. I mean, this is going to be one of the most, let's say, difficult to negotiate points because this will determine how big 
the stick of the data protection legislation is going to be. So effectively, what you need to tr be trying to be thinking about when you're looking at the data protection legislation challenges is how you need to be prepared, how do you need to move, how do you need to position yourself from a state of, if you like, um, uh, react from a reactive mode for a state of whereby you're reacting to incidents into a state that ideally you've got privacy and security built from the beginning of your processes. So um, ideally, before the incident happens, you need to be in a position to protect your information. You need to have a response capability in place to deal with the incident, but also you need to have an understanding of what other kind of information, what, kind, what other kind of infrastructures that you need to have in place to, uh, to know what you're trying to protect. What's your risk posture? What are you up, to, up against? This is the risk management bit. And obviously, unless you have the detection capability, you, you don't know you've been breached, you cannot meet the deadlines, you don't know that you need to respond, you're in the worst possible position. And obviously, you're then carrying the maximum risk. And equally, the biggest challenge for you then is to demonstrate that you've been, you, that you have not been negligent, that you have been diligent. So, uh, if you like, the way the whole law is designed is trying to push the risk management, the risk-based approach on one hand, and on the other hand, to require of organizations to have the capabilities to respond and manage the incident once it occurs as part of the complete information life cycle. So, clearly you need to figure out what are the key things that you need to be protecting. And quite frankly, from an organizational standpoint, you'll have several. Um, uh, you'll have personal data, you'll have financial data, you'll have you know, safety data. You'll need to manage, you'll need to focus on what you need to protect. And clearly also, you will need to protect them wherever they are. Because mobility, cloud, all these are going to be issues that you need to be thinking about. Where is my data? Where? How do they flow? And then, you know, my perimeter is elastic. How do I need to make sure that these, are, these controls and protections are in place? If we look at it from a general security standpoint, we try to divide the issues between threat, threat protection and information protection. So keeping the bad stuff out and making sure that the good stuff stays in. Uh, obviously, there is an element that has to do with how do we detect the breaches, how do we stop them from happening, and how then are we able to manage and mitigate the incident. And then there's the compliance bit, which has to do with how do we manage, monitor, demonstrate ongoing compliance so that we can answer to the question that we get from the customer or that we get from the regulator. Okay, show me that you've, show me that you've been diligent. Show me that you've done everything you could. Um, how can we help? Well, first of all, I mean, as I said, we need to think the threat protection, the information protection, and how do we bring all that in a way which marries the compliance. We need to be thinking about then the realities of the environment in which we are. The regulatory scope is expanding, the information is everywhere, and that the threats will unfortunately continue. And then, in terms of what does this mean practically for us, it means that we need to expand our ability to protect. It means that we need to embed governance, embed the best practices within our own security. And well, we need to move our ability to protect systems everywhere, anytime. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time and coming and listening, and I'll be happy to take any questions.